Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, and thanks to the Ellen Institute and all the organizers for um, making this um, presentation possible and bringing us all together. So we're going to switch now to learning in human infants and the contributions of uh, imaging the baby brain, a technically challenging thing to do, and to talk to you about some of the newest results that suggest we can really improve learning for all children. So we're going to use as an example something quintessentially human. Uh, most of my examples will come from uh, language learning in the human baby. We're trying to understand exactly what it is that humans have to do, that step-by-step -step process to acquire a language or two or three. The game changer here is the fact that we can now image babies using MEG. Uh, so MEG is a quiet, non-invasive machine. The baby can sit and act. We're tracking their heads. It's a technical tour de force, and you get functional movies uh, while the baby's doing something, listening or acting. Uh, at the same time, we're trying to combine images of function with structure, looking at traditional segmentation, VBM, uh, DTI, quantitative MRI now, and doing that in the service of the basic uh, questions that we're asking about uh, the science of human learning and development, but also attempting to take that research and move towards translational studies that demonstrate that we can change the course of uh, learning in children with autism, with dyslexia, with uh, various um, disabilities involving language. Now, why are we interested in very young babies and how they learn language? Well, look at the curve. Uh, this has been established over many laboratories over many years. There simply isn't an equal learning curve across age with regard to second language acquisition. So if you find your age on the bottom and your score on the vertical axis, you'll realize that as adults, we're just not so good at this. Whereas the babies are geniuses. So between zero and seven, and this is a cartoonish representation, but across many studies from zero to seven, children show an amazing capability to acquire a second language simply by living in the environment in which that language is spoken. Every two years after the age of seven, your ability changes. And after puberty, it dramatically changes. Doesn't mean you can't learn a second language, but you don't seem to use the same uh, implicit learning mechanisms. You don't operate in the same way. Your skill level will never be the same. So in this broad curve, there are little curves. Uh, specifying different aspects of language learning. The first one, uh, learning the sounds of language, that's the one we're going to focus on today. For babies to acquire words, they have to know which sounds in their language are contrastive. Every language uses about 40 to 44 contrastive elements. Baby's job, first job, is to figure out which are the sounds that are going to be used contrastively in my language. But in, we're not going to talk about them today, but there are equal uh, kind of small windows of opportunity where word growth happens at a rate of 15 to 20 words a day. There are times in development a little bit later when grammar is acquired with amazing speed. So what our, our process is to understand what's the magic the babies are putting to work in that early period that I and most of us in here, all of us in here, uh, can no longer put to work. So uh, we began with behavioral assays in many, many countries of the world. I had eight laboratories at one time, and I'll show you the behavioral test I was using with uh, uh, sounds of many languages. And we wanted to know what babies can discern, what differences can they discern early in development, and how does that change with development? Uh, and so here's the behavioral uh, measure. Can a baby as young as six months old hear the difference between two vowels? This baby is trained to look for the toy when the sound changes. She's being distracted, so she'll turn only when she hears the difference in sounds. Uh, the key uh, question, will she turn before the toy lights up? Uh, uh, e, 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 e. Okay, so over about 20 years, we demonstrated that babies are literally citizens of the world in the early period. There isn't a single song, sound contrast from a single language that we can get them to fail on. They can just do them all, whereas the parents sitting behind them, the mother or the father, are, are completely unable to discriminate the sounds that don't belong to the repertoires that they were exposed to early. And if they're bilingual or trilingual, then all of the sounds that they have been exposed to in natural language, they can discriminate, but not the others. And whether you do these measures 
users as we did 20 years ago with behavior or whether you use event-related potentials and play a background sound like ah, 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 and the deviant is E, you see the same results from studies that uh, demonstrate across all these countries that babies are universalist citizens of the world to begin with and then become like us, which are the culture-bound listeners uh, by about 12 months. So here's that result. Uh, they change from babyhood, that universal stage, to the more um, uh, you know, determined language-bound listeners before first words at 12 months. So here's one of the studies. This was done in the United States, here in Seattle and in uh, Tokyo, using a contrast ra, la, very important to English, but completely unimportant to Japanese, not utilized to distinguish words. So what you see is that in both babies at uh, six to eight months tested on this head turn task or with ERPs, that they're perfectly capable, both of them, about 65% correct, uh, chance is 50%, well above chance at this age of six to eight months. But two months later, something pretty dramatic happens. The American babies go straight up, get a lot better, and the Japanese babies get a lot worse. And this is the pattern we see all over the world. Uh, all babies are doing what they should do to acquire words in their language. It's good that Japanese babies start failing on RL, because if they were paying attention to differences that don't matter, uh, perception would be less efficient. So we've got them by their first birthdays when they acquire first words, already sorting out the sounds that are uh, important to the language. So, of course, we want to know what's happening during this little two-month period. We do know that this learning that we see early in development is extremely important for future language. That degree to which the baby attends to the right stuff and starts non-attending to the, to the wrong stuff uh, is predictive of language to 30 months and reading readiness at the age of five. And this isn't auditory acuity. This really is learning. What we see here is if we use native language predictors, meaning a, a native contrast on the left, a non-native contrast on the right, and we do median splits so that you see in red on the left the better kids, the better half of the distribution at native language discrimination at seven months are much faster in the acquisition of words than the lower half of the distribution. But on the right, you see the kids who are still good at seven months at non-native language discrimination, they're actually slower to develop language because they haven't yet sorted out what am I supposed to be paying attention to. They're still paying attention to the non-native predictor. Uh, they're listening for sound differences that don't make a difference in their language environments. So our critical question was what are, what's going on during that period? What are babies doing that you and I are no longer doing? And there are two things that we've discovered. One is computational, and the second is social. The computational part is that babies are extremely sensitive to the statistics of things coming in around them through their sensory systems. We've shown it for vision. We've shown it for audition. We've shown it for patterns of haptic uh, presentations to babies. The more frequent the type of stimulus, the more likely the baby is to hone into that stimulus. So for sound, the more frequent the phonetic unit in the language that they're hearing before they can understand any words. It's like they're taking distributional statistics on the language input that comes in. Different kinds of statistics. So for word finding, it's the uh, transitional probabilities between syllables. But for phonetic learning, it's really the distributional frequency of the phoneme. So let me illustrate that. I'm going to have you listen to two women, an American woman with a two-monther and a Japanese woman with a two-monther. And they're going to speak what we call mother's milk to the baby's brain, motherese or parentese, this high pitch, a very slow and very clear speech uh, to babies. And then I'll show you the distributional uh, trick that the babies are performing. Oh, I love your big Can blue eyes. we turn eyes? up the audio? So pretty and nice. Wow, okina chairoi omeme. So na kuroi kami. Okay, so what the babies are actually doing is shown in the next slide. They're very sensitive to distributional statistics. And in American speech, high frequency for R's and L's. And in Japanese speech, very high frequency for this intermediate sound that is the Japanese phoneme non, you know, non-RL discrimination. It's, it's that Japanese R against W. And so you can change in the laboratory in three minutes how well babies can discriminate American R and L by manipulating the statistics. If I play American type statistics, the babies get better at RL discrimination. If I play Japanese-like statistics, they get worse 
at RL discrimination. And this happens quite quickly. It doesn't last, but you could test right away their sensitivity to distributional statistics. So, but that's not all that's going on. They're not just computational automatons. Uh, there is a very strong role for the social brain. So what we did was expose uh, a nine-monthers right in that critical period to a foreign language, either Mandarin, Chinese, or in other experiments, Spanish, and the outcomes of both are the same. We did in the original experiments a social exposure. So my native speaking, you know, postdocs and graduate students played on the floor for 12 sessions with babies between nine and 10 months, right at that critical window. So they got about five hours ex of experience in the foreign language. So let me show you a bit about what that looks like. Jasper, Okay, so what do we do to their little brains when we, you know, present them with 12 sessions of this kind of stuff? Can they, can they perform the statistics? That was our original question. And the answer was they did so well they were statistically equivalent to the kids in Taiwan or into, in Hong Kong. They, in that period of time, they could learn that contrast uh, with, with great expertise. We began to wonder what is the person, what's the role of that tutor, because they loved these sessions and they loved their tutors as they'd come back to the labs. What we found was that in the TV presentation, when the DVD replaced the person, exactly the same material, same room, same dosage, same everything, no learning whatsoever took place. None. Even though they stared at the screen, they went up and touched it. Some kissed the screen. Some tried to, you know, do something with that screen. Uh, absolutely no learning in the brain measures. So uh, they looked like control kids who had just been exposed to English. Uh, so it, it really has to do with this social uh, setting. So our hypothesis is that there's something about the social brain and there's something about the information provided socially. We've tracked eye movements of the babies. We can predict learning by the degree to which the babies follow the eye movements of the tutor. So when a tutor holds up a new object and names it in Spanish or Mandarin, the babies who are watching the tutor then looking at the toy and back and forth, those social, um, very sophisticated social babies at nine months, the ones who are better, learn more. And uh, so there's an informational component of social. There's also another component, a kind of social arousal component. In all of our studies to date, whether it's Spanish or Mandarin, whether they're doing the screen or doing it live, two babies learn better than one. And it's not as though another, a baby teaches the other baby how to do something or pay attention. It's the mere presence of a second baby. The more new babies a target baby learns with, the better they learn. So there's something hormonal, arousal-oriented going on during these learning sessions. Okay, so that's the behavioral backdrop. What does brain imaging add to this? So here's the big machine. We put the little ones in. Uh, magnetoencephalography, it gives you, you know, in a silent, it's a silent machine, which is wonderful when you're trying to present auditory or other interesting stimuli to babies. They're not being, you know, and they don't have to sit still. We were the first in the world to uh, show how you could uh, put babies in an MEG machine. So this little one is uh, a three-monther listening over insert earphones to the sounds of many languages. And we are tracking uh, her head with pellets that allow us to see at all points in time where the, where the brain actually is. So we were, in our first study f created by our MEG machine here at um, the iLabs at the University of Washington, we were interested in how infants were making this transition between six to 12 months, what brain areas were involved. We're very interested in the sensory motor connections because babies at this time are not only mastering by listening. They're not only building the architecture for perception, but they're building an architecture that allows them to imitate, to reproduce. And the, the question is, how in the world do babies imitate at the, at the age of 10 months? How is it that they, when you say, you present a new word to them and they're able to mimic it, it's not trial and error. What, how are they learning motorically? 
the brain imaging helped. So here we see a 12-monther already to that stage of, of uh, focusing. Segmentation showing about 150 areas. We're doing an ROI type analyses with auditory cortex. Very interested in Broca's because Broca's areas is motor planning. There's the arcuate connecting them. What we see next are the red bubbles. So this is firing. This is MEG recorded magnetic field changes representing the, the neural firing to the standard sound, which is an English sound. That's our background sound. Here's our new English sound. And you see that an increase in auditory firing. And then the contrasting language sound, which is by now a non-native for a non-native sound for the 12-monther. And the surprise here was the, we had seen Broca's firing all along, simultaneous with auditory. The increase in Broca's to the non-native is very interesting to us. What we think babies are doing early in development is based on their own schemas for auditory motor development. So if you've watched babies in cribs or listened to them, they play with sound all the time. They coo at 12 weeks. They start babbling at six months. In the laboratory, they can imitate at 20 weeks. You play ah, and they'll produce something more like ah than e and, and the reverse. What we think is happening is as perception is coming in, the motor system is attempting to simulate what it would take to produce that using its own very nascent abstract motor plans. So they must be very crude. But as you get to be a 12-monther, your motor plans are quite good for native sounds. But non-native sounds, you have no clue what to do. So we see greater activity over a longer duration, a, bit, a bigger spread of activation, in fact, at the 12-monther period for non-native speech. So the statistical result is this. When you look at six-monthers, uh, you see that there are no differences between non-native and native in superior temporal and inferior frontal sensory motor. All the same for, for uh, Spanish and English. By uh, 12 months of age and in the adult, you see the same pattern. Uh, firing in superior temporal auditory goes up for the native, but up higher in inferior frontal for the Spanish. So this V-shaped curve, the 12-monther looks very much uh, like the adult. So that's very, very interesting. And we're trying to track how early in development. So we can scan one-monthers, and we want it before they've had a lot of you know, uh, schema development in sensory motor. They're not babbling much. So we want to see if we see this Broca's activation uh, in one-monthers and, and what kinds of experience influence the development of the pattern at 12 months. Let's take a second to look at the bilingual brain. So, uh, you know, in America, we have very few bilinguals, but each census shows us that, you know, every 10 years, we increase threefold the number of kids uh, under five who are listening to a language other than English at home. Our schools are trying to, uh, to understand how in the world we're going to uh, help the dual language learners learn uh, in English, in our English schools, content information when their home language is something different. We've been bringing uh, babies into the lab who are bilingual. Here's just a setup with a, a bilingual baby and showing the capping. So we, we need to track those heads. So we're using a Pohemus type device to draw the head, and then we'll know uh, what the baby's, where the baby's head is at all times when here's dad putting the baby in the machine. There's the baby in the machine. She's listening. Um, there's actually a soundtrack here. but. Uh, so she's listening to, to variants of Spanish and English, da, ta. Uh, and you can see how still she is. She's one of our, a very good baby. Sometimes they move a lot more, but she's transfixed, and that's good, all right? Because the less they move, the less the tracking problem has to be, um, has to be uh, calibrated for. Here's brain activity, and I'm showing the bilingual because what's interesting about bilingual babies is the degree to which the uh, prefrontal cortex is activated. We know that all bilingual people are better at uh, problem solving. They're not smarter, uh, but they're better at inventing new solutions to problems. When a problem comes up, rather than using the old solution, they're better at inventing new ones. And I'll show you what that looks like in an 11 month or in a second. Here's the statistical result. Uh, the interesting thing here is that, of course, monolinguals are doing exactly what we thought. Their sophistication for Spanish is not there at, uh, at this 11 month age. Uh, they're good at English, but the bilingual babies are equally strong 
in representing English and Spanish, which is very good news because people believe incorrectly that exposure to two languages is somehow dampening the response to the primary language. Uh, nothing like that is the case if kids are getting native input in both languages at the same time. Here's that prefrontal cortex activation that we see. The red line is the bilinguals, and the green line is the monolinguals. Um, I'm running out of time already. We're creating bilingual babies in Madrid. Madrid has uh, four-monthers, 55% of the four-monthers in uh, nursery schools from uh, 9 in the morning till 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I've got a set of 16 UW undergraduates spending their junior year abroad. Uh, using this, all of the secret sauce we know to exist uh, to create that bilingual brain. In one hour a day, we're showing that the babies can be, uh, amazingly ignite both English learning. The parents don't speak English at home, so they're just getting English one hour a day. And we've got randomized controls so we know exactly what's happening. I won't have time to talk about this, but we've done a study that's just coming out in PNAS, uh, integrating our first gene looking at genes, CompT gene, and um, brain changes using DTI and learning a second language in 18 to 20 year olds. What we've shown is that when you have uh, the control, you're looking at FA in the SLF, a whole brain analysis shows that the right uh, superior longitudinal fasciculus connecting language areas to frontal cortex. Here are the controls, FA, but as time goes on in the um, immersion, they're in an immersion class, the experimental kids, um, their FAs are going up while uh, RD is going down. This pairing is typically associated with myelination, but this is very fast myelination if that's what it is. We don't know. And after the immersion experience ends, you see the decline in uh, the uh, FA um, uh, characteristic of, of integrity of that fiber track. Uh, genes, uh, the CompT gene influences this relationship. Uh, MET-METs, uh, so there are three variants of the CompT gene. MET-METs don't change at all. Uh, MET-VALS and VAL-VALS show this pattern of change over time. So it's a very intriguing finding, but our first, Evan Eichler and I collaborating with the postdoc Pim Mamia uh, and uh, seeing what we can learn about the genetics and how they influence brains in the service of learning. Uh, I want to touch on the effects of early experience and where the lab science is going. We know in America that it depends, your socioeconomic status uh, affects how many words you hear. By the age of three years, kids in welfare families hear 30 million words less than kids in professional families. But it's not only, and these are strong associations between socioeconomic status and every measure of language that we know of, and particularly literacy. Our work in the lab says you can take SES out of the equation if you measure the amount of parentes. That video you saw of the women speaking this slow, exaggerated speech, parentes, the prevalence of parentes in the home at 11 months is very strongly correlated with words produced at 24 months, whereas standard speech has no relationship whatsoever. So, and you can just take SES out of the equation. If this is the kind of talk that kids are getting highly engaged, highly social, face-to-face, -face, parenties, kids' language development zooms forward, and not so much if they hear fewer words or if they hear standard speech. We're also showing that music intervention makes a difference in childhood at that same nine-month period. If you play uh, the waltz to babies in social groups and they use uh, motor skills to tap out the rhythm of the waltz, and whether it's the Blue Danube or Take Me Out to the Ball Game, uh, they heard many different ones in their 12 sessions. We can show brain effects. Here's a little bit about what they did. Doesn't matter. They, they were just listening and tapping on their little drums. When you meg them afterwards, again, randomized control from the music to the control group, what we see is that music trains the brain to be better in auditory cortex to do detect changes in rhythm in pieces of music, but it also extends to speech. And it's not only an auditory cortex, it's prefrontal cortex. We train the brain to expect patterns, and the brain gets better at memorizing the patterns and then reacting when the patterns are violated. So part of the reason that early experience is so potent is that it trains brains not only in their sensory arenas, but in the, audit, the cortices, the prefrontal cortex in particular, to expect patterns and predict patterns. 
Okay, um, one last thing. We're looking at early brain markers for dyslexia and getting very, very exciting work uh, done. This is Maria Mitag's work. She shows that in babies born to parents diagnosed with dyslexia, as opposed to parents, uh, babies born to parents who've never been diagnosed, there's a big change between six and 12 months. At six months, right and left hemispheres in response to a modulated noise look identical. But at 12 months, the standout result is the dyslexic babies, dyslexic history babies, left hemisphere responses seem to respond on time, but simply whole, like perseverate that neural response. Very classic of dyslexia is the inability to process in visual or auditory information rapidly changing things. Letters too close together uh, and sounds too close together in time. This would be exactly what you would predict. It's also the dipole changes from six to 12 months in uh, typically developing children and not in children with uh, dyslexia. We're also showing beautiful predictive, we're now following the children in the two dyslexia the controls and dyslexia families to the age of three years. And our early findings look like these measures are very predictive of, of, of delayed development in uh, language. And so the beauty of these uh, tests eventually will be that you could get in and intervene in very interesting ways that we understand now to change the course of that child's and the family's development. Okay, um, I better make this the last one. We're looking very closely at autism. We have very good measures at two years of age, but it's not early enough for us. Two years of age, if you use words, known words, as a measure of brain function, how well known versus unknown words are responded to, you use that predictor at age two to predict at age four and age six, not only language, but cognitive function and uh, adaptive behavior. The reason we think it's so good as a predictor, it's better than any predictor I know at the age of two for autism. The reason we think it's so good is that word learning is a measure of social learning. If a child with autism can learn socially, or let's say to the degree that they can, all of cognition and language and adaptive behavior improves. To the degree that they cannot learn socially, that predicts poor outcomes downstream. And these data are regardless of treatment. All of these children were treated, and I could color code which treatment they were getting, but the main point is the predictor predicted regardless of the kind of treatment. We did not test children who did not receive treatment. Obviously, all of these children are receiving treatment. So that's very exciting. And there's other work on, on DTI and whole brain imaging that is leading to measures predicting of when children are ready to read. So the bottom line here is that the future of neuroscience for children is that we will be identifying early in development predictors that show the tendency towards risk for developmental disabilities and that we would be able to get in and treat and time, this is Jason Yateman's work, timing of reading differs across children. He has a measure of the arcuate that demonstrates there's a time that we're reading instructions too early, there's a time when it's too late, and there's a time when it's just right. When FA is increasing rapidly in the arcuate, that's the time for reading instruction. This is the last one. Um, we're building a, a brain studio at iLabs that will allow us, one of our problems is to merge data. The MRI people, the MEG people, the EEG people, these are all differently trained scientists. And merging measures on a, an individual child to a common space, and that's difficult, but it's very, very informative for individual children. So this is a studio in which we don't collect any of the data. This is analysis. This brings all of the scientists with different backgrounds into the same space and allows them to use very fancy visual tools to, um, to merge their findings. So um, that's it. Let's um, stop. Um, science of learning is getting exciting. We have a lot of collaborators and tons of funders because it takes a fortune to do this work. Uh, so with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cole, for that fascinating talk. We have time for time. a few questions. A few, few questions. Any questions? Well, yeah, this one in the back, right there. Yeah. 
vocalized. No, they're not. So we see the same thing. I showed you the data for a 12-monther, but they're doing, and they don't, they're not babbling either. They're just listening during these things. And um, the seven-monthers do exactly the same. So in the seven-monthers, they're activating inferior frontal to both languages. So this is before most kids at seven months have not started canonical babbling. You know, they're not doing ba 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 ba. They can uh, they can uh, coo, but they're not up to babbling. So um, these sounds are much more complex than anything they're going to be producing for about 18 to 24 months. They're, they're very hard sounds to reproduce. So we think that uh, this activation is about uh, a motor plan, but it must be very crude. You know, it, it's just based. If you think about a baby babbling, it's like moving your arm. You're learning, if you want to fetch something over here, babies don't do trial and error after a while to get there. They know something about the parameters of the arm. We think you know, that kind of body babbling and this kind of oral babbling that you hear them do in the crib is building a schema to relate auditory and vocal characteristics. So it's like an auditory articulatory map. They get to learn that by raising their tongue, you get a more E-like sound than a Ah, like sound, and that map becomes very sophisticated. It's not, it's not a trial and error imitation by 12 months. By 12 months, that model is so sophisticated that they aim and get to where they're supposed to go quite easily. So something's got to be developing the motor plan prior to the time when they can do the more sophisticated thing. So that's our hypothesis right now. And we see it, so I would love to know if I see it at one month in the brain to speech. And we've also modeled and tested, you don't get that kind of simultaneous activation to non-speech. So a harmonic tone or some kind of modulated noise, you do not get Broca's activation. I bet you wouldn't get Broca's activation to that same degree in children with autism. I think that mapping, that self-other mapping, that sensory motor connection, is disrupted in children with autism. Was there okay. another question? Oh yeah. So um, I'm suddenly very curious about this. Um, no one would argue that teaching your child more than one language is now a bad thing. That's obviously a good thing. But do you have any kind of feel for um, what the ideal number of languages might be? Yeah, no, that's a great uh, question, but we don't. I mean, is there a limit to what, to what number you could map? And I, and I have no idea. There are people. Polyglots, uh, Jackie Kennedy knew six languages and could read eight, but spoke well six languages and all exposed early in development. So and if you're exposed to two and map them beautifully early, you're better past the critical period at acquiring a third and a fourth. So there's something about that early exercise of the prefrontal cortex, I think, that makes your attention more flexible and your ability to we also know from imaging that all language circuits, whenever you're listening to speech, everything is activated. The English circuit, the French circuit, everything's, and you're actively suppressing uh, the um, non-native, the one that's not being used right now, as you focus on French, for example. Then you're turning off, trying to suppress the other circuitry. So, but we don't know what the ideal number would be. We just know babies are amazing at doing it. Thank you. I have one question. Yeah. I'm going to sneak in. So when you have the babies in the scanner, have you considered looking at what happens when they fall asleep? We right. haven't done any resting state. We haven't done any sleep studies yet, but I think it's a very interesting thing to do. Uh, we're very interested in what is different in the brain as we're now doing studies where there's a live speaker, and we're very curious about social learning. There's something about human beings in front of human beings that makes a difference to the brain. So we are now have the baby in the scanner, and we're looking at live versus a televised uh, you know, situation for learning to see what, what's, going, what's going on up there. We're also scanning, hyper-scanning. So we've got mothers and babies uh, both hooked up. So baby's in the MEG, and mom is in a 64-channel EEG system, and we're co-registering. And we're trying to see the dependencies between the two brains, the causal and coherence type measures that uh, under different conditions, like mom's talking to the baby, mom's affectively touching the baby, or mom's looking down at her cell phone. Um, uh, that's, a practice that's, that's <laughs> very, very common these days. Well, I ask because you probably know this, that in bird songs, developing birds, well, of there's course. evidence yes. that song crystallization and exactly. the Exactly. So, I mean, I didn't have a chance to, uh, to say it. Alison Dope and I, uh, oh, okay. in 1999, 
published the paper. If she were alive, we'd be writing another revision. Uh, very sad that, that she passed. But we were always comparing uh, birdsong and uh, babies babbling. So much similar in terms of the sensory learning and then sensory motor mapping. The new news here, though, is that at least in humans, you've got this motor activation right alongside the early auditory perception. So I'd be very curious to look at the bird uh, area, the HVC, and these other areas that are responsible for motor learning. Are they activated while that early sensory learning is going on? Because those parallels have been so good. And, and the social part with zebra finch, the need for the social presence of another bird for the baby birds, to the males to learn. So that's fascinating. Great. Thank well, you. thank you very much, again. guys.